For a long time here at Tech Yes City, you guys have been asking me about these budget AliExpress X58 motherboards. Now this one here is a pretty much bottom of the barrel. It's cheap as chips, $53 ship. This is how much you can get this thing for. Now traditionally, this takes away some of the features that you would get on a higher end older x58 board say from a zeus i use a rampage here at the studio it's got six ram slots and of course with that you get to unlock triple channel memory but since this is only 53 dollars, i am going to go pretty easy on this board and in fact i'm going to be recommending it to a lot of people out there on a budget because there was a lot of things that actually did impress me about this board however we'll go over all the negatives and all the positives in today's video so let's get on with it. If you've got this annoying Windows needs activations message and you wanna get rid of it for cheap, then today's video sponsor SCD Keys has you covered. For as little as 14 bucks after you use the coupon code BFTYC, you can get yourself a legit single end user Windows 10 license today. Links in description below. So straight away, getting into this motherboard right here, you're probably thinking, why is there only two slots of memory available? And I think that they've done this, of course, to reduce the cost of the board. Now it is a micro ATX board, so it will fit in pretty much all cases out there, except of course, if you're going with mini ITX. But one thing that I do like about these two slots of memory is that although you're losing the triple channel, which is a negative, you're still getting dual channel, but it supports ECC registered memory. So I'm using two eight gigabyte sticks and the numbers that I'm gonna put out for you guys uh, today were tested on these cheaper, and I'm saying very cheap, ECC registered sticks. Now, one thing about the ECC registered, it goes hand in hand with the low cost of the board, as well as the cheap cost of these Xeons, making a total combo that you can pick up here going for as little as $80. If you can get the RAM cheap enough, which I've picked up around, I think I picked up around 380 something gigabytes of this stuff for $100 Aussie dollars. That's how cheap ECC registered memory can go, especially on the DDR3 side but we've still now got 16 gigabytes in it with a six core 12 thread. Now, the Xeon I'm gonna use in today's comparison is the X5670. This can be had for around, I think it's $15 ship worldwide. Now on this board, it will go to around 3.06 gigahertz on all six cores 12 threads. And you can go into the BIOS and now the BIOS is a little bit outdated. So that is a negative in relation to this board, but you still get ironically the option to overclock. Now I'm gonna go against overclocking on this board simply because when I did the temperature test here in Cinebench R20, I found that the six core 12 thread was really heating up this board to the point where it got to 95 degrees on the heat sink temp on the North Bridge side. And then the VRM reached 100 degrees and also the heat sink on the VRM reached uh, 59 degrees. However, there is some good news to that. And that is if you put a fan over this uh, Northbridge heatsink and your VRM heatsink, you can drop temperatures drastically down. 74 degrees it then became, and then it also uh, 57 degrees and 49 degrees respectively over VRM and then VRM heatsink. So this board, if you do get it with the six core, don't overclock it and put a fan over that VRM area. This is gonna give you longevity and it's going to make sure that the board works absolutely fine. Now, another thing that did surprise me is that they've included a USB 3 front header on a board that never had the USB 3 front header on it. So it's good that they've added in sort of these newer touches and they've got native USB 3 on board the uh, input output at the back here. However, when I tested the USB 3 speeds, they were kind of like USB 2.2, 2.3 in that they went to around 135 megabytes per second solid transfers where USB 3 I thought went a lot higher than that traditionally, even the first generation of USB 3. So you will get faster speeds than the 50 megabytes per second cap on USB 2, but it still will be around 130 megabytes per second transfers. So do keep that in mind. Another negative of the board itself is the SATA ports here and that if you've got a, a bigger than a two slot graphics card, then you will need low profile SATA connectors in order to use these SATA ports. Otherwise your graphics card will just hang and block out those SATA ports from being used. As you may be able to tell with the B-roll in question. Another thing is too, the eight pin power connector for the CPU, that's a little bit out of place. So you will have 
an 8-pin uh, power connector going sort of down to the board in a weird fashion where it's, most people are used to having it up the top, but I'm guessing it's going in a cheaper case anywhere where cable management isn't too much of a priority. And of course, if you're on a budget, you might not even use a case at all. Now, the seller I bought this off also didn't include a CMOS battery, so you will have to buy one of those yourself. I generally source them for around 20 cents a pop and then I get five of them for a dollar. So that shouldn't be a problem. The uh, front panel audio out is also angled at 90 degrees, which was an odd thing too. And then you've got one USB front out 2.0 header as well as the USB 3, and then two fans, one of those being a PWM 4 pin, one of those being a three pin. However, all up, I cannot complain about the board a whole lot, especially at $50, the uh, one gigabit per second NIC speeds, they tested out absolutely fine, so they were full speed. You get a six layer PCB too, so it's not that flimsy. And the final thing is, this one surprised me the most, was the onboard audio actually tested out to be a minus 8.5 decibel roll off. So of course it's a, uh, a bit worse than the high end motherboards, but it wasn't terrible by any means. You could use this onboard audio with a cheap pair of speakers or a cheap pair of decent headphones like the KS, uh, KOS KS uh, C75s, they're a really good pair of headphones I recommend on a budget, but you could use that and still not be uh, doing damage to your ears. I have seen motherboards in the past that have come through here on budgets and the onboard audio has been absolutely horrible. This one here actually is not too bad, which was surprising for that price point, having a minus 78 decibels crosstalk. So this board so far was doing okay, but what about the gaming numbers? And this is where I decided to test out the X58 with the X5670 overclocked to 4.4 gigahertz. And of course, at these levels, we were seeing numbers, both with an RX 570 in certain titles and a GTX 3060 Ti. So I will pull up the numbers here for you guys where CSGO was getting 335 FPS versus 238 on the Jingxia motherboard with one less uh, channel of memory available. Fortnite was doing 192 FPS versus 142. And then uh, Doom Eternal was doing 166 versus on the uh, X58 Rampage, 223. And then F1 was 133 versus 197. And that was on a 3060 Ti, which I just wanted to show you guys sort of like maybe this is the best case scenario you're going to want to pair on say an X58 Rampage. When it comes to budget, I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to be eyeing off this motherboard and saying RX 470, RX 570. So I did some tests with the RX 570 as well. And here's where we got on CSGO 313 versus 223. And then moving on to Fortnite, this is where one of those weird things happened. That is on the RX 570 on both the Jingxia motherboard and the Rampage, we got more FPS. We got 199 versus 167, but the, both those numbers were higher than the 192 and the 142 that we got on the 3060 Ti. So it's doing something funny here with the CPU that is giving us more FPS from the CPU directly on the RX 570. Then moving on to Doom Eternal, we got 118 versus 116. So we're getting very similar FPS here on an overclocked memory and CPU on the X58 Rampage versus the Jingxia. And then the final game, F1 2020, we got 139 versus 152 on the Rampage. So there wasn't a whole lot of differences to be had when we're using an RX 570. In fact, CSGO showed us the biggest difference and then Fortnite actually worked better on the RX 570, which does give weight to the fact that this here, and this is where we're gonna move into conclusion time, it's time to tell you guys if this board is worth the $50 or not. I think that's the most important question that it all comes down to. If you're on a budget, are you gonna be getting your money's worth? And what we saw there with the gaming numbers, they pretty much really go hand in hand with a budget graphics card. And that's what I like about this combo. In 2021, anywhere in the world, you can get yourself one of these boards for close to 50 bucks, a $15 Xeon, cheap memory if you can find the ECC registered stuff and pull it out of old servers, even better and then you can get a snowman cooler and you're going to be seeing some very good performance for the dollar all this combo with 16 gigabytes of ram is going to cost you less than a new i3 and will you get any more performance out of that i3 with a budget graphics card i think that's the most important question and i think the answer is pretty much no we're not going to see a whole lot of performance on an rx 470 or rx 570 as we saw uh, the differences when we started overclocking on the rampage wasn't a whole lot to be gained there with the RX 570. The 3060 Ti, of course, there were some big differences 
and that's when we're going with the higher end graphics card. But then there's the board itself. The build quality is decent. The BIOS, of course, is dated, but all BIOSes on X58 are going to be dated, but they do include a uh, low profile SATA connector for one drive. If you want to hook up more than two drives, you'll definitely need to get, especially if you're using a dual slot or bigger graphics card, you'll definitely need to get another low profile SATA connector. You get the input output shield. And then out of the box, it comes all pre-configured. So you'll support those Xeons and you support the ECC memory without you having to do anything but install your CPU. However, one thing I will say, the biggest uh, thing to get under control with this board is those uh, VRM and also the Northbridge heatsink temperatures. From what I saw here, definitely want a 12 centimeter fan or even an eight centimeter fan. You'll definitely want that actively cooling this motherboard in order just to, uh, for me, it's peace of mind. I don't want my temperatures going anywhere over 90 degrees for longevity. And the fact that the heat uh, heat sink was going to 95 and then also the VRM, we saw 100 degrees there in Cinebench R20 was um, once we put the fan on, those temperatures went down a lot. That was for me uh, the point that I want to stress if you're going to get this board because everything else kind of checked out. The USB 3 speeds were fine. The NIC speeds were fine. The onboard audio, surprisingly, was even fine too. So Jingsha, they've done a pretty good job on this board. I can recommend it just know that I can recommend it with the butt there. And another thing is too, I did quickly test out the X5677. If you don't wanna put a 12 centimeter fan on this, then you can get the X5677, which is four cores, eight threads. So I did manage to do some temperature tests for you guys in 26 degree ambience, by the way. All these temperatures are done in 26 ambient here today. And we got 58 on the heat sink and then 85 on the Northbridge heat sink. So it would be, as long as your case is half decent, you can get away with no fan over that um, motherboard with a four core eight threaded Z on the X5677. And then if you uh, put the fan on there, you'll get as low as 47 degrees on the uh, VRM heatsink. But if you're lazy and you don't wanna put a fan on there, then you might wanna opt just for the four core eight thread where I'll show you guys the results in tomorrow's video where we've tested out the X5677 as well. And we're gonna talk about whether these Xeons are still relevant in 2021 and who they're relevant for. So I think there's a lot of sort of like, you should be done with the used stuff, but I think of course, there's always a place when the price is right. And I think right now, when I look at those Xeons on AliExpress, the price is definitely looking right. $15 for a CPU, 15 bucks. And you got cheap motherboards like this that are brand new. I think there's going to be a place for that even if the new CPUs are $100 because people are always after a good deal and it depends where you live in the world. Some people don't make as much money as people like us, like in Australia, for instance, we've got a pretty high minimum wage here. It's pretty easy to get that $100 CPU, but in other countries, say the minimum wage is only three bucks. That might be the difference. That might, And especially if they just want to play some games here where we saw the FPS numbers at 1080p, 152 FPS in F1, or um, 118, um, they're all above 100. So the FPS numbers are absolutely fine here, whichever way you look at it. So if you want to go with those fine FPS numbers and you want to save money, then these are still offering a really good play in 2020. But anyway, we're getting too off topic here. I'll leave that for tomorrow's video for you guys. In the meantime, this board right here, it's good to go. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button for us. And also let us know in the comments section below, would you buy a board like this in 2021? And if you did, would you buy it with the iconic snowman? Love reading those thoughts and opinions as always, just like this question of the day here, which comes from my face. And they ask, I've had my board for about a month and every now and then I experience random freezes. Is this an issue people are commonly having? And they're talking about the X99 AliExpress motherboards that we took a look at where you can unlock the turbo multipliers. Now, these boards will occasionally freeze if your voltage is too low. So when I did test this thing out, I did um, do, these are the X99 Xeons, by the way, which are also pretty good value. Um, when I tested them out, there's different profiles that you can lock in. And typically a lot of people uh, lock in the minus 20 millivolt profile. Though the thing about that is it's still minus 20 millivolts. So say for instance, you got a pretty or really cheap power supply that's, not, that's got pretty high ripple and you're supplying that board and the voltage is dipping sometimes, that could be the reason why it's crashing out. And so with that, you might wanna use say, just a zero millivolt file where there's no difference to the uh, voltage, hasn't changed, or you might wanna use one where it bumps it up 20 millivolt. Of course, with that power consumption does go up, 
but that is one thing you can try. Or of course you can try getting a new power supply, but I'm guessing if you're on a budget, you might not want to do that. Though in terms of getting that profile with the higher millivolts for the CPU programmed in there, you can try some of those different millivolt profiles. They are out there on the web. Hope that answers that question. And with that aside, I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. And also if you stayed this far and you're enjoying that tech, yes, content, and you want to see the moment it drops, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell, and I'll see you next time.